All right, since Northwest is gonna be closed for possibly a few weeks, or it may be until the end of the semester, I decided to go ahead and record um, my lectures. And so today we're gonna to be looking at barn burning. And I'm just gonna kinda of give you an overview so that you don't have to watch a really lengthy video of me talking. But the story barn burning, it was printed in 1939 in Harper's Magazine. And as you were reading the story, some of you might have gotten upset at the racial slurs you were reading. But this is an example of real, realistic um, writing and uh, William Faulkner definitely was trying to portray that. And so you're going to see the type of dialogue that you would have seen back in 1939 had you lived during that time period. Now the setting of the story, we know that the story begins at a general store and at this general store they're actually having a court session. The story is eventually going to move to Major Despain's plantation where um, this family is going to be sharecroppers uh, on his plantation, which means that they get to live there um, and use another person's land to grow their crops. And then at the end of the season, they will use some of those crops to pay the plantation owner, or Major Despain in this case. Now, as far as like a literal town name, it's not given for this story. But I know that typically William Faulkner has Yachtnapatawpha County as the setting of his stories. I'm going to repeat that. It is Yachtnapatawpha. Yeah. Um, but this is basically a fictitious town that is based on Lafayette County because we are reading one of our Mississippi writers who's from Oxford. Okay, so this story also has several characters. Our protagonist is definitely Sardi, who is a young child. Um, he is definitely illiterate, and you may say, Miss Pierce, how do you know he's illiterate? I'm going to be reading some excerpts, so get ready. I have my book in front of me. I'm on page 1187. I'm in the first paragraph. So he's in this general store and it said, Sardi knew he smelled cheese and more from where he said he could see the rank shelves close packed with solid, squat, dynamic shapes of tin cans whose label his stomach read, not from the lettering which meant nothing to his mind, but from the scarlet devils and the um, silver curve of fish. So it's just like uh, if you saw the McDonald arches, you would know, oh, this is a place that serves hamburgers. Well, he was looking at the labels and figuring out what was in the cans just by the little logos on the, on the can. But he's definitely going to be the character that we're most sympathetic for. And um, we're going to see him change in the story. He's definitely a round character and he is the protagonist. Now, as you're reading the story, I bet you notice that some of the wording was italicized. This is um, moments that we are actually in Sardi's mind, and we know exactly what he's thinking. So as far as a narrator, this is a third-person limited narrator because we know Sardi's thoughts. I believe it was at the last class after we watched the movie in class. I remember Justin saying, doesn't Sardi have... Uh, gray eyes. He does. Just like Sylvia in A White Heron had gray eyes, we're going to see Sardi having gray eyes because this whole story is dealing with the conflict and turmoil that he's going through. And so he's trying to make an important decision, um, gray eyes being a mix of white and black, so kind of good and evil going on in the story, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the other characters that are in this story, he has an older brother named Flem, and Flem is the spitting image of his father. We have his mother, her name is Lenny, and then we have an aunt, and we have two sisters, and it's kind of funny how uh, Faulkner refers to the two daughters as bovines or cows, and he just kind of shows them as silly and chatty. But um, our antagonist, our, our villain in this story would be Abner Schnopes. And so if we were in class right now, I'd ask you, how would you describe Abner Schnopes? And most of you would say, Miss Pierce, he's malicious, he's belligerent, um, he is very racist, he's uneducated, he is the meanest, vilest person I've ever met. Um, I love the way, you know, I think of darkness and blackness when I think of, of evil or um, and then we have some very interesting descriptions of Abner Schnopes. Am I going to read them? Yes, I am. I'm on 1187. Here is the way Abner Schnopes is described. At the bottom it says, His father, stiff in his black Sunday coat, donned not for the trial but for the moving, did not even look at him. 
He aims for me to lie, he thought again, with the frantic grief and despair, and I will have to do it. All right. Um, on the next page, um, let me see. Well, I'm looking for a good one to read. Just hang on. 1188, center of the page. It says his father turned and he followed the stiff black coat, the wiry figure walking a little stiffly from where a Confederate provost's man's musket ball had taken him in the hill on a stolen horse 30 years ago, followed the two backs now, since his older brother had appeared from somewhere in the crowd, no taller than his father, but thicker, chewing tobacco steadily between the two lines of the grimmest of the grim-faced men and out of the store and across the worn gallery and down the sagging steps and among the dogs and half-grown boys in the mild May dust where he was passed, uh, where he passed and a voice hissed, barn burner. All right, so the father is always in black. He's thin, he's wiry, he's sneaky. We discover that he has um, an injury to his uh, ankle or foot where he's been shot because we learn right away in this story that he was not a soldier for the Confederate Army or for the Union Army. He basically went to war to be a thief and to steal from the armies. And he got shot and caught at one point. All right, in the beginning, we see that Sardi wants to be like his father and he wants his father's approval. When they leave the general store slash courthouse, um, people are hollering out, barn burner. And Sardi takes up for his father and starts kind of this brawl outside the general store. Even when he hops in the wagon, his mother's trying to wipe the blood from his face, and he's like, leave me alone. So he's very much like his father in the beginning. Now, 1189 is a very, it has a very key line in this story. At the bottom of 1189, you'll see where Abner is talking to Sardi, and he says, you're getting to be a man. You gotta learn. You gotta learn to stick to your own blood or you ain't gonna have blood to stick to you. So what do you think that exactly means? If you think about it, he's telling Sardi that if you're going to be honest and have integrity and not stick with your family, you're gonna be left completely isolated and alone. But as long as you're being dishonest, lying, sticking up for your family, you'll always have family around. All right. So in this story, we notice that they have moved 12 times. 12 times Abner Snopes has burned barns. Why is he burning barns? Well, just like when we read The Revolt of Mother and Father was building all those barns, barns is, would be where you would store your plows, your horses, your grain, your seeds, all those things that would be needed to grow food for your family and also to bring in money and sustain your family. So... Um, I guess you could say Abner hit them where it really hurt the most. So they move into town and right away um, they decide to go visit Major to Spain. And when they get there, Sardi notices the house. Now in the movie when you're watching or when you were watching the movie, that huge house of Major to Spain's was actually William Faulkner's house in reality. It's over in Oxford, you can go visit it. And he called his home Roanoke. But when they see this courthouse, this is what Sardi says. Sardi says, this is on 11, page 1190. They are safe from him. People whose lives are a part of this peace and dignity are beyond his touch. He no more to them than a buzzing wasp, capable of stinging for a little moment, but that's all. The spell of this peace and dignity, rendering even the barns and stables and cribs which belong to him impervious to the puny flames he might contrive. All right. So he sees it as a courthouse he mentions in one of the lines. When you think of courthouse, you think of justice and laws and honesty, and it kind of foreshadows what we're going to see Sardi do at the end of the story. All right, so they get to the house, and here is where the conflict begins, man versus man, because you see where Abner Snoke steps into a big pile of horse dung, and he walks into the house. There's this $100 rug lying on the floor, and he wipes his feet on the rug. Well, this infuriates Major Despain's wife, and we later see Major Despain bringing that rug to Abner Snopes' home to be cleaned. All right, and so Abner Snopes has his two daughters clean that rug, and they do a great job. It's ready to be returned, but it, he doesn't let it in there. Um, 
you can remember from the movie where Snopes goes out and finds a big uh, chunky rock and he throws it on the rug after it's been cleaned and he starts scrubbing it until there are holes in the rug. And then he takes that rug back to Major Despain's house and throws it on his front porch. Well, Major Despain comes to him and says, you know what, you ruined my rug. I know you don't have $100 to pay me, um, so you're gonna owe me 20 bushels of your corn. And Abner Snopes decides to take him to court. Now, even in the court scene on page 1195, you can see that the judge is rather lenient because rather than 20 bushels of corn, the judge asks for 10 bushels of corn to be paid to Major Despain. People are just not really um, mean to, to Abner Snopes. Even in the beginning, when Abner Snopes' um, pig gets, gotten, uh, gets out of the pen, we see that the neighbor brings him chicken wire to put the to put around the hall. He tries to help him out, but Abner just Snopes is just so vile. All right, so toward the end of the story, we know what's about to happen. Based on the title, Barn Burning, we know that Abner Snopes is planning to burn Major Despain's barn. Now, it's kind of interesting. Anytime you're reading about Abner Snopes in this story, you'll see things like, he whips the horses without heat, he speaks without heat, um, this man knows how to set fires. And for him, fire is power. It's the one thing that can take these upper class people down a notch. Um, it's what's going to cause them the most pain or inflict the most pain on them. I do want to flip back for a second because he learned to set fires while he was at war. And so on page 1191, I'm going to, excuse me, not 1191. Dun, dun, dun go back to 1189, and I'm going to read about um, the way they camped and how Abner Snopes always set those fires. And this is going to be a lengthy paragraph, bear with me. That night they camped in a grove of oaks and beeches where a spring uh, ran. The nights were still cool and they had the fire against it of a rail lifted from a nearby fence and cut into lengths. A small fire, neat, niggard. Niggard means um, stingy. That's a word we don't hear very often. A shrewd fire, such fires were his father's habit and custom always, even in freezing weather. Older, the boy might have remarked this and wondered why not a big one? Why should not a man who had not only seen the waste and extravagance of war, but who had in his blood an inherent voracious prodigality, which means wastefulness, with material not his own, have burned everything in sight? Then he might have gone a step farther, farther and thought, that this was the reason that niggard blaze was the lively fruit of nights passed during those four years in the woods hiding from all the men blue or gray with the strings of horses and older still he might have divined the true reason that the element of fire spoke to some deep mainstream of his father's being as the element of steel or of a powder spoke to other men as the weapon for the preservation of integrity all right so he learned to set these fires <clears throat> when he was stealing during the war. And we see that even now, he, he, even though he doesn't mind spending other people's money and burning down their nice barns, he's very stingy with his, his flame. And it talks about how most men would use guns to get back at people. His father used fire. And that was like his, fi his father's way of feeling powerful. All right. <clears throat> so we see him heading to Major to Spain to set the fire. I'm sorry, I'm flipping like crazy here. All right, um, naturally, Sardi is supposed to be tied up, but he winds up getting loose and he runs to Major Despain and he's hollering out in the middle of the night, you know, barn burn, barn burning or whatever. On 1198, you know, we hear a couple of shots fired and I know when I read the story, I thought, okay, Abner Schnokes has been shot, good riddance, but I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that there is a trilogy with Abner Snopes in it, and he is alive and well after this story. But I even think Sardi thinks his father is deceased because I'm on 1198 at the top. It says he was still running even after he heard the shot, and an instant later, two shots, pausing now without knowing he had ceased to run, crying, pap, pap, running again before he knew he had begun to run, stumbling, tripping over something, and scrambling up again without ceasing to run looking backward over his shoulder at the glare as he got up, running on among the invisible trees, panting, sobbing, Father, Father. 
All right, and so he starts out Pat Pat, that's the name he always uses, and then he changes it to Father Father, and you'll read the next paragraph. It sounds like you're reading a eulogy um, at someone's funeral. The next day, the last paragraph is interesting. There's words that jump out on the page to me. It's words like dawn, then dawn's used again, walking would be a cure, it was a late spring night. It's a rebirth, because what did, what did Sardi do? His eyes are gray because he's in this conflict. Should he stick with family or should he do what's right and good? And he does what's right. And he tells Major to Spain that his barn's being burned. And so he's turned on his family and his father. But um, that idea of rebirth and dawn, I have this optimism that Sardi's going to be okay. But at the end of the story, we see him in the woods spending the night, and he is completely alone. His, fa his family has deserted him. But the last line says he did not look back. All right, so he went with integrity and honesty. And I think that's why he has those gray eyes, because um, the plight of his life and all these um, decisions he's having to make in the story. If you have any questions about the story, feel free to email me, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and throughout the rest of the semester, the next few weeks, this is what you're going to be getting from Miss Pierce, some little snippets of lectures. All right. Have a good day.